um, good day everyone. My name is Mr. Jeremiah Balogun from the Department of Computer Science and Mathematics and I will be running you through the course CSC 101 titled Introduction to Computer Science. So in this particular session we are going to be studying session 1 which is titled Basic Concepts, History and Classifications of Computer. So the learning outcomes of this course would allow you to be able to define and use correctly all the keywords printed in bold, define computer and explain data processing, enumerate the characteristics of a computer, explain the processes leading to the emergence of a modern computer, identify the features that differentiate one class of computers from the others, and finally, classify computers based on their size, their type of signal that they process, and the purpose for which the computer has been created. So the introduction. It is very important for us to understand that the computer has become a part of our existence in the current world. In the 21st century, we find ourselves in what we refer to as the information age. And to process this information, we need devices that can do this at very, very remarkable speed. Hence, the computer has become a part of the 21st century. So it is quickly becoming the 21st century's worldwide machine. It is the tool via which people do everything that they do. Individuals could not afford to buy any computers in the past because they were too massive and expensive. Like I can remember some time ago that it was said by one of the CEOs of the early computer manufacturer saying that he never saw a need for the computer in the schools or for the computer in the homes. Lo and behold, today we now have computers being used as embedded systems in your printers, your ACs, your cars and your smartphones. So, as a result, they were restricted to labs and a few research institutes because these were the only set of people that could afford to purchase the computers as at this time, military institutions, research institutions, and banking institutions. And only, program, only computer scientists could program them, meaning that you only need experts handling them. I guess that was why the CEO had that misconception then. Unlike today, you don't need to be a computer scientist for you to be able to handle a computer. So we saw the evolution of the computer from one generation to another becoming more user friendly. So in this session, we attempt to present the various landmarks and milestones in the development of the computer in its chronological order. So before we start off in understanding all we need to know about computers, what exactly is a computer? So a computer is any device or any machine that you can use to process data and provide an essential information. So if you have any particular tool and you can actually use that tool to be able to manipulate data that is provided as an input to provide reliable information, then what you have is a computer. In other words, it can also be said to be the ability to process the central processing unit. That is like the brain of the computer system, which is similar to the brain of the human being. So it takes input through an input unit. The input unit could be a keyboard, it could be a scanner, and then the information is being stored in the memory. Example of memory could be your hard drive or your flash drive or the hard disk. And this information is being processed by the CPU and transferred to the output unit. So there are some terms that we need to familiarize ourselves with. In the first part, when I defined the computer, I said it receives input as data. So what exactly is data? Data refers to information about a person, an object, or a location. So examples of such data could be a person's name, or the age of the person, or the school the person attended to, or the height of the person. Whereas information is data that has been processed into meaningful statements. For example, the net pay of a worker. The data that is being used to generate the net pay of the worker is probably the daily wage of that particular worker. So by bringing this information together and processing it probably as a sum, then we can get what is called the worker's net pay. Another example of information could be examination results of a student. So the student takes some particular questions and answers the questions and the, the scores of all these questions have been added together to get the final result of the information. So we've understood that there is data and there is information. So that means that there is a process via which data is being converted to information. So that takes us to the methods of data processing. So there are three major ways in which data have been processed over time. The first and second most popular earlier techniques that we had were the manual methods and the mechanical methods. <clears throat> in the manual method, the human being 
requires the use of either a chalk or a pencil or a wall or any other manual method as a mean of gathering the data and processing the information. And these technologies, equipment or tools make it easier for humans to be able to record, classify, manipulate, sort and store information which we've seen over the years in our libraries, in our schools and so on and so forth. But later on, as human beings were beginning to be able to manipulate materials on the surface of the earth, we started having mechanical tools for processing this information. So we had examples of such tools as typewriters, the Ronio machines, adding machines like calculators as automated mechanical ways. Although in some cases they were not purely automated, in most cases the human beings still had to manipulate this machine. But because they were a machine, they could not get tired, so they could do the job much more faster. So these machines aided humanitarian efforts, especially in the area of data recording and information recording, classification, manipulation, sorting, and presentation. And then we have what is called the computer methods. So in the case of the computer methods, we have a machine that now has a central processing unit that is responsible for processing the information without the influence of a human. So output reports are typically clearer, they are orderly, and they can be formatted automatically in various ways using graphs, diagrams, and photographs. And data and instructions can also be stored temporarily and permanently, and in so much size. So the computer has the capacity to be able to store and retain information more than the normal human can. Quality and efficiency became more improved, computers don't get tired, they don't forget things, they don't get weary, they don't get emotionally disturbed, and data can be processed in a consistent and continuous manner simply because computers became more reliable. And as the technology that was being used in creating these computers became better, the operations of these computers became noiseless. That was little or no noise were being heard and errors were reduced drastically. So this brings us to understand that the computer has a number of characteristics that must be understood. So one of the characteristics is accuracy. The computer is very, very, very accurate. Every answer it gives you is consistent. The once, first time you use it to perform a particular problem, the second time you use it to perform that same problem, it's going to give you the same result with very, very, very little error, especially in areas where precision is of importance. In another area, you have to understand that the computer does everything it does, it is automatic. And it does this using what is called a software. So once the software has been installed in the computer's memory, it gives the computer the ability to be able to perform actions. Another thing the computer has capacity to do is that it is fast. And the processing capabilities that computers have make them able to be able to do things in a very short time. A human being can only perceive a second. But a computer has, for example, if I take a computer of one gigahertz, that means that the computer can actually divide a single second into one billion parts. So you can think of the power that the computer has that makes it useful in the common world that we find ourselves today. Another thing is that the computer is also flexible. It can be used to solve a lot of problems, a wide area of tasks. Today we find it being used in education, in industry, in politics, in economics, in banking, finance, security, name it. Part of the characteristics of the computer that we also have to understand is the reliable. It is reliable, it doesn't disappoint. It is fast and it is accurate. And in terms of storage, it has the ability to internally store uh, information and externally store information. So the external information can also be used as backup, just in case information is lost. So it is important for us to understand that the computer system, the user and the environment in which the computer is used to make up of the computing system, which basically composes of what is called the hardware and the software part of the computer system. So in the computer system, we have the hardware. So what basically is the hardware? These are those entities that we can see with our physical eyes, like the input unit, the output unit, the storage units, and all other parts of the computer. And devices that fall under this category can be the mouse, the joysticks, and scanners. Another part of the hardware is inside the processor, where we have the arithmetic logical units. These are responsible for handling most of the processing. We have the control unit, which manipulates how the computer takes actions. And we have the memory, where the, where the information that is being processed by the computer is being stored. Another aspect of the computer is the software. Now this is where all the various instructions that allow computers to perform their various tasks are being stored. So we basically say that this set of instructions are called a program. And software can fall under various categories based on the purpose for which it is being created. We have the system software that includes the operating systems that allows a human user to be able to easily communicate with the hardware. We have utility software like antiviruses and we also have what are called application software. 
So now that we've known so much about what the computer is and the various parts of the computer, it is time for us to really understand how the history of the computer came. Well, the first uh, concept about processing started from the understanding of the Chinese abacus. So we've had people like the Chinese abacus, we have the jacquard loom, and we've had Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage made a very, very close attempt by creating what was called an analytic engine. But his idea did not come to fruition. So a description of mechanical, analog, and digital computer architectures would later be included into the world of computer science. So we now later had what we call the mechanical instruments, such as the merchant calculators, which were later being created in the 1960s. However, the relative virtues of analog and digital computers were exactly being debated in the early years of electronic computer system. Some people felt that since analog computers were based on physical quantities, they had their ability to be more precise than digital computers. But some feel that since digital computers were using discrete systems to solve problems, then that means that we have to have systems that could be able to handle the level of inaccuracy that we have within them. However, analog computers were utilized to solve systems of finite difference equations emerging in the oil reservoir modeling as far back as the 1960s. But in the end, digital computer systems demonstrated that they have the power, economies, and the scalability that were required because most of these systems were built on electrical functioning parts. They did not depend on moving parts like the analog computers, which were, which were liable to wear and tear and on the long run affecting their ability to solve problems with limited accuracy. And so currently, digital computers rule the computing world in every domain that you can think of, from the portable hand calculator to the supercomputer. And as a result, the overview of the evolution of scientific computing is limited to these digital electrical computers. So, digital computer history is frequently separated into generations because what makes the historical understanding of the computer is when we put into consideration the type of computer technology that was being used, the kind of materials that were being used to process information, internal computer system, organization, and programming languages over the previous generation. Although algorithms, especially those employed in computational science, are not commonly associated with computer generations. We are not concerned with the algorithms and the software, but more with the hardware that we are using to solve this problem. So the following history is organized around these well-known generations. So the very first generation of computer existed between the 1937 to the 1953. And these technologies made, these computers made use of technologies such as the vacuum tubes and the magnetic drums to store information and process information. However, they were too big, they were too slow, they were too expensive because the, the materials that they were using to solve, to solve this problem and the computations were still limited by some physical characteristics which did not give them the ability to be able to solve problems at much fast pace. Then by the second generation of computers, we had that at the end of the first uh, Second World War between the 1954 and 1963. So from the technology used to design fundamental circuits in programming languages, needed to write scientific applications. So the advancement of the level of computer system design had come into fruition at this particular point in time because now computers now have programming language. To be specific, first generation were more limited to machine codes, which simply means it was just dependent on the signals that the machines were passing to each other. But by the second generation of computer, von Neumann had already created the stored program concept. So we could now translate information from one level to another level. So as a result of that, we now had what were called assemblers and compilers for converting information from higher levels to lower levels. So in 1947, John Baden, Shockley and Walter, working at AT&T, created the first transistor, which made it possible to be able to process this information. So these transistors replaced the vacuum tubes, thereby ushering the second generation of computers. Now, as the development of computer processors were going, we needed to increase computational power. Now, the concept was that we now had what was called a, a transistor. So, we were now moving into what we were calling integration. So, we needed to move into large-scale integration. So, large-scale integration pushed in an era whereby transistors were now compiled and brought together. So, this led to the construction of what were called integrated circuits, ICs. So, we had multiple transistors being embedded together, thereby giving the computer more processing powers. And this was if, uh, uh, motivated by the use of semiconductor memories instead of the magnetic cores that they were using in the first generation 
and the second generation of computers. So the semiconductor um, era caused a great revolution within computer science by the point of the third generation of computers. And then we could now perform what we call multi-processing and parallel processing in the computer system instead of the past batch processing that computers were doing in the past. By the fourth generation, we were already creating what we call the microprocessor. Now, this, at this particular age, we had achieved what was called the ultra-large scale integration, meaning that multiples of these ITs could now be embedded. Remember that ICs consist of thousands of transistors. So we now have thousands and even millions of these ICs being embedded together to create the microprocessor. And the microprocessor technology ushered in the world of portable computers. So we started having devices like portable radios, portable mobile phones. That was how the age of the satellite phones started coming into being our personal computers and the likes because these were built using what we call a single silicon chip. Compare the first generation computer that could actually fill a whole room and to the new generation computers that hardly can fit the palm of our hand. And the first set of these computers was created back in 1971 by Intel and it was called the 4004 chip. So it's located all the components of the computer. So on that chip, we had the central processing unit, we had the memory, we have the controls for the input and output control. All you just needed to do is just place this on the breadboard, connect the interconnecting parts and connect them to the processing um, areas. That's the peripheral devices, is an input device or an output device to be able to send information and bring information that is being processed by the computer. By the fifth generation of computer, which is the world where we find ourselves presently, the, world, the computer now had the ability to be able to respond to natural language. Now, natural language in data analysis is being referred to as unstructured data because it is not like data that you can say, okay, what is your name? What is your age? What is your gender? Words that have been spoken is natural language and it can be interpreted as frequencies. These are things that our natural ear perceives and communicates to our brain and we can hear. So in today's world, computers now have the ability to be able to effectively communicate with human beings and they are also becoming cybernetics they are self-aware and that has also brought about the shift to what is called artificial intelligence so this has now made us move from the world of algorithms to a world of heuristic learning where we now have computers learning from human information and being able to do what human beings can do so we now have computers performing the basic tasks that the normal humans can perform now, after the fifth generation, some people are also telling us that we are also having the sixth generation taking place because we now have the concept of parallel computing, we have the concept of internet of things. Now we can also talk about processing has now moved from basic um, computer processing power to graphical processing power and making very, very small computer devices to be able to do what a lot of big computer devices could not do in the past. So sixth generation computers is all about scalability having more power but making the device as miniaturized and as portable as possible and that is what has ushered the 5G uh, generation into networking. Another way in which we can also classify a computer is on their sizes, yes, based on how large that a computer is. So we have what we call the microcomputers, we have the mini computers, we have the mainframe computers and the super computers. So basically, what are the microcomputers? Well, microcomputers are those computers that are the smallest in size. Microcomputers also compose of portable computers like your laptops. And microcomputers also compose of smartphones, portable devices like your smartphones, game consoles, and the likes. And all these microcomputers are composed of CPUs, input units, output units, storage units, and a software that is installed on them. Most of the times, most microcomputers are for a single user. So they are single user multitasking system. And that is where the word, the personal computer came from because it only needed one person to use it. Mini computers, on the other hand, are much bigger than microcomputers, but not too big, but they support enterprise users. So if you have a company and you want multiple people to be able to make use of a central computer, which sometimes people could also refer to as a server, then you can have the mini computer under that particular classification they have the ability to be able to process information much more faster than the microcomputer. However, they also have other characteristics such as the input, output, and the software. Mainframe computers also are much more bigger than the multi-user systems. They can be used by multinational organizations. The supercomputers are actually the fastest and they are the most expensive 
computers across the world. So depending on the size of the organization or the purpose for which that particular organization has been created, there's a particular class of computer that is available for such sets of people. So we can also talk about computers in terms of their facility, what we can use them to do. So like we said earlier on, we said computers are very, very flexible. However, there are two major classifications in terms of versatility. We have the general purpose computer. So from the word general purpose means the computer can be used to solve a wide variety of problems. Okay, that is they can be given different programs to solve different types of problems like your personal computer. It's a general purpose computer. There is no particular problem that your general purpose computer cannot do, your personal computer. It can be used to watch movies, it can be used to hear music, it can be used to type documents, it can be used to browse the internet. On the other hand, we have what we call the special purpose computers. These are computers that are built for a particular purpose. They don't have any other, like, for example, let's take a computer that is responsible for assembling a vehicle. The only thing he does is assemble the parts and even there are different assembly, there are different points in the assembly line. So even that particular robot can only assemble a particular part of the engine. The robot that is assembling the door cannot be the same robot that is assembling the chassis or the engine of the car. So a special purpose computer is a computer that is built for a specific purpose. So that brings us to the end of our understanding of the course of CSC 101 and we've been able to understand that the computer is any electronic device that can accept data, process it and produce an output. The computer method of data processing is superior to the manual and mechanical methods simply because it is more accurate and it is more reliable. And the computer system is made up of the computer system itself, the user who are communicating with the computer system and the environment within the computer itself is operating. And we learned that the first generation of computers used a technology called the vacuum tubes for its circuitry and the magnetic drums for its memory. And three scientists from the AT&T labs were responsible for contributing to the discovery of the transistor. And we later learned that AI are means via which machines are programmed to think exactly the way human beings think. And we were able to understand how to classify computers based on their sizes, based on the type of sigma that they process and based on their versatility. We were also able to classify machines based on their size. We understood that we have the microcomputer, the mini computer, the supercomputer and the mainframe computer. We also were able to describe them based on the type of computer that the signal that they process, analog digital computers. Analog computers basically process uh, continuous information, digital process discrete information like the present computer that we have and we also looked at them in terms of their versatility and we got to realize that computers can be, be referred to as being general purpose or special purpose so, and later we got to realize that microcomputers now come in various sizes so it is gradually becoming smaller so we went from desktop to laptop to spam top to smartphones even we now have embedded devices in a lot of our household products so here are some self-assessment questions that I would like you to take your time out and look into each and every one of them and study them and master what has been put through you within this particular module. The questions have been presented as follows. So we'll define a computer, outline the landmarks of the first generations, of the first three generations of computers. What are the landmarks? What are the ways via which we can describe these different generations of computer. It is very, very important for us to be able to understand this. And then list the four types of computers that we have based on the size of the computer. So thank you very much for taking your time out. God bless you.